Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army South Windsor Citadel. We are pleased that you are joining us for worship this morning. Some words of encouragement and invitation from the Salvation Army songbook this morning it says, Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand thousand are their tongues, but all their joys are one. Hallelujah to the Lamb who died on Mount Calvary. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning and the invitation that is ours to come and to add our praise to the angels who are singing in your presence. Father, we thank you that we can unite our voices in one and declare how worthy you are. Uh, we thank you for the privilege of continuing to meet together in this way, uh, to focus our attention on you. We thank you that you are present with us wherever we find ourselves this morning. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through this act of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be free from your burden of sin?
Good morning. Well, we've all had a great Easter celebration, and I hope that sometimes as we journey through Easter and afterwards, we can kind of tend to forget all that Jesus has done for us. But this course is about remembering all that Jesus has done. When I remember that he died for me, I'll never go back anymore. When I remember that he died for me, I'll never go back anymore. No, no, never, never, uh, 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 I'll never go back anymore. No. Them up 
to love you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good job. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 20, starting in verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. May God bless his word this morning. Let us bow in prayer before we reflect further on God's word. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks for the ways it speaks to us and challenges us. I pray that you would open not just our ears, but our hearts to receive your message this morning. Pray that the reflection of my heart would be honoring and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I find myself analyzing and reflecting on song lyrics quite often. Currently, playing on the radio is a song by Jordan Feliz called Faith. While the tune and the sound are quite catchy, and while the sentiment of the song may be true, I found myself thinking that not everyone would appreciate the encouragement from this song. The song begins by saying, There is no ocean that can't be parted. There is no mountain that can't be moved. 
I know there is hope for the heavy hearted. The weak will find their strength renewed. You just gotta have faith. And then this line, just gotta have faith, is repeated numerous times throughout the song. Have you ever been told that you just gotta have faith? Or perhaps you heard the phrase as, you just gotta have more faith. What were the circumstances surrounding that comment being made to you? And how did receiving that comment make you feel? Last year, I read through the book, The Unexpected Adventure by Lee Strobel and Mark Middleberg. And in a chapter called Making Room for Questions, Mark Middleberg shares an encounter he had with two high school students who were near ready to abandon their faith altogether. Turns out these students had questions, lots of questions, but the congregation they attended didn't make room for questions. Instead, in response to any questions that they raised, they were told that those things are just things that people of faith must accept by faith. You just need to believe and then you'll know it's true. When asked how they handled that, the students shared that they tried to comply, but their doubts only grew. At a summer camp, when they attempted to ask their questions again, they were told, you must not raise these issues here. You'll only confuse the other campers. As a result of this brushing off of their questions, these students felt as though they didn't matter, and they had concluded that the Bible couldn't be trusted and that Christian faith teaches things it can't prove. The areas of concern for these students were common objections to why God allows evil and suffering, questions about the reliability of the Bible, and problems with hypocrisy among religious people. Mark Middleberg took three hours simply answering the questions that these students had, giving room to explore the doubts they had, and offering good information in response to those questions and doubts. The result of taking time to answer questions and to respond to doubts was a recommitment to Christ, a first-time commitment to Christ, and then the spark of a desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ confidently with others. Every chapter in the book came with an action principle, and the one that was associated with this particular story said this, When someone harbors doubt about faith, it doesn't help to tell them they simply must try harder to believe. Spiritual confidence, our own and that of the people we want to reach, comes when we ask questions honestly, face objections squarely, and present information accurately. Ultimately, our faith is not true because we believe it, Rather, we believe it because it's true. Christians and everyone searching for God should be lovers of truth who base their beliefs on what is real. We have nothing to fear because our faith rests on a bedrock of genuine facts. The book tells of other instances where responding to someone's genuine doubts and questions with real answers was a game changer in how people responded to the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Bible, God himself, do not stand in conflict with fact. Truth is, God has always made room for questions. Now, sometimes it might seem as though uh, God's response to doubt is a little harsh. I think of Zechariah in the New Testament uh, not believing that Elizabeth in her old age is going to have a baby and questioning how. Uh, Maybe the response of making him mute seems harsh. (laughs) But on other occasions, we see that in response to human doubt, human questioning, we see a patient and loving response from God to those doubts of the ones he calls. There are so many interesting people, just ordinary people in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New. In Judges chapter 6, we meet Gideon. 
son of Joash the Abizrite. At the time of meeting Gideon, the Israelites had been living under the oppression of the Midianites for seven years. And in Judges chapter 6, verse 6, we read, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Picking up in verse 11, we get just the beginning of Gideon's story. So if you want to follow along at home, I am reading a little bit from Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. It says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Now, if you are familiar with Gideon's story, then you'll know that these are not the only doubts or questions that Gideon raises. But as his story continues, Gideon will continue to check in with God to ensure that he's hearing the instructions accurately. Gideon is bold enough to raise his objections. We hear him repeat phrases like, pardon me, my lord, but if... Even after he confirms that it really is an angel of God speaking to him, or perhaps the Lord himself standing in front of him, he still has doubt about the actions that he's being asked to take, and he continues to test that. But rather than responding to his doubt with anger, or because I, the Lord, said so, now just do as I say, God entertains Gideon's questions. And Gideon emerges confident in, the, in his faith in Yahweh. On the heels of the resurrection, we meet someone else bold enough to voice their doubt. Despite the witness of the women and the group of disciples, Thomas declares he will not believe in the rumors of Jesus being alive unless he sees the nail marks in his hands, puts his finger where the nails were, and puts his hand into Jesus' side. Jesus obviously hears this declaration because he responds without Thomas having to say anything directly to him. But he doesn't respond in anger or annoyed. He doesn't say, come on, Thomas, how many times did I tell you what would happen to me? How many times did I try to prepare you for the events that would happen? How many signs did I perform while I was alive? Why won't you believe the testimony of the crowd of witnesses around you? No. Into Thomas's doubt, Jesus shows up and addresses Thomas personally. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. His address comes with an encouragement. I don't see or hear this encounter with Jesus as a rebuke to Thomas. I see it as Jesus caring enough about Thomas to respond to his doubt. Thomas then declares who he believes Jesus is, my Lord and my God. To which Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who can believe without seeing. But Jesus knows that there are still those who need to see in order to believe. God is aware that people continue to harbor doubt and objections. There's another song on the radio called Famous For, or I Believe, by Torin Wells and Jen Johnson. And the chorus of this song says, Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire, do what you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions, bring dry bones to life, and do what you are famous for. God, I believe in you. Now, I'm not going to lie. The first time I heard this song, I wasn't quite sure I loved or felt comfortable with these lyrics. Part of me felt like after all Jesus has already done and accomplished, after the witness of everything we have recorded in our Bible, who are we to ask for more signs? However, I realize that there are many things that cause doubt and fear. And some need God to personally show up in their lives in a mighty way before they can pledge allegiance to him. The encouragement I see in Thomas's interaction with Jesus and Gideon's interaction with the angel of the Lord and other ordinary human beings throughout scripture is that Jesus cares enough to show up personally. He continues to go to great lengths to prove to you that he really is real. I also hear a challenge from Thomas and Gideon, though, and that challenge is to be bold enough to name your doubts. What are your, pardon me, my Lord, but statements? What are your, unless God does this, I cannot believe, statements? Now, I'm sure that some people are thinking that we're warned against testing God. And perhaps you feel that this encouragement to name our doubts is improper. But I'd be willing to argue that testing God is about much more than naming doubt and asking questions. Testing God is almost an entirely different message, so we'll leave that for another day. What I want you to hear today is that God cares about you. God cares about what's bothering you. And God is concerned about that which is standing in the way of you declaring that Jesus is your Lord and your God. I want to encourage you today to name your doubts. Ask your questions. And then be prepared to respond when Jesus shows up. Lee Strobel's testimony is one that will never cease to amaze me. If you're not familiar with it, then I would encourage you to either read or watch uh, The Case for Christ. You'll learn about who he was and uh, his discovery. But in a nutshell, Lee Strobel was an atheist who set out to debunk the resurrection. After tons of research, meeting with experts on various aspects to attack the resurrection, Lee shares that he was confronted with the truth. Having asked all there was to ask, having heard the various answers, Lee was confronted with Jesus. He couldn't debunk the resurrection. So he was confronted with, will you now believe? There came a point where Lee had all the facts. And the question was, what would he do with the information that he found? Having all the facts, Lee could no longer deny Christ, but was instead led straight to Christ. And now he meets with people and answers their questions and skepticism about the reliability of the Bible and all those tough questions that we sometimes shy away from. God is not afraid of questions. The gospel holds up to scrutiny. Yes, there are certainly times when we do just got to have faith. There may not always be answers to everything, but the faith that we have rests on a bedrock of genuine facts. Name your doubts. Ask your questions. 
Be prepared to respond when Jesus shows up. I wholeheartedly believe that he will. It may not be immediately. For Thomas, it took a week. But I believe that Jesus will show up personally to address your doubt. Then you will be faced with the question yet again, who will you declare that Jesus is? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks for the reality of the human experience that is reflected in the people that we meet page after page, book after book, chapter after chapter <laughs> throughout the Bible. I thank you that we see that they have doubts and questions sometimes. They don't always jump when you say jump, but sometimes they say, excuse me, pardon me, Lord, but how could I possibly do that? Excuse me, unless I see this, there's no way I am believing what I'm hearing. But Father, I thank you that we hear through that, that we can come to you with our questions, but then also to be challenged to see that you answer. And so I pray, Father, that as we ask our questions, as we name our doubts, that we would be prepared to respond when you show up, that we would expect you to show up. Or perhaps we name our doubts and our doubt is that you won't show up. Father, I pray that you would prove us wrong. I pray that you would draw us closer to you, that in asking our questions, in seeking out answers, I guess is the other part of that, that we would be led to this undeniable faith, to a confidence uh, in who you are. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that the tomb is empty. And uh, just pray, Father, that you would continue to draw us near you. I pray that you would help us not to be afraid of the good news of Jesus Christ, not to be afraid when people ask us questions, but that, Holy Spirit, you would speak through us and use us as messengers of your good news. We just pray that your word would find fertile soil today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. Yes. The winter storms may blaze. Empty 
Over my
Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. And it is our hope and our prayer that the Lord use this time to just renew your mind, renew your heart, renew your commitment to following him. Our benediction this morning is from the Salvation Army songbook, song 1029. Jesus, so dear to us. Jesus, be near to us. Jesus, give ear to us, each as we pray. Jesus, whate'er betide, Jesus, be friend and guide. Jesus, be by our side, now and for a. Go, remembering Jesus, be at peace.